Imagine you're a pregnant woman in 1959. You're exhausted, nauseated, and your doctors find a new pill. It's non-addictive, it's modern, and most importantly, it's safe for you and your baby. Or at least that's what the doctor was told. So you take it, and a few months later, your child is born without arms. That drug was thalidomide. It was given to tens of thousands of pregnant women across more than 46 countries. And the result was one of the greatest drug-induced tragedies in medical history. It just so happened that my first application was for the drug thalidomide. I got this because I was new and they thought I should have an easy one to start on. Welcome back to the Scholar's Journal. So today we're going to be talking about thalidomide. And first we'll start with what it even is. So it was a drug that was first synthesized in 1953 and was sold starting in 1957. It was, designed, it was designed as a sedative hypnotic drug and as an anti-nausea drug. It was marketed in Europe, South America, Africa, and even parts of Asia. It was sold under the brand names Distival, Tensival, Valgrain, and Asmoval. It was never approved in the U.S., though, thanks to the FDA reviewer, Dr. Francis Kelsey, who resisted corporate pressure in 1960 to introduce it. So here's what the company claimed for it. So... The DeSillis company, Biochemicals Limited, in 1958 said that Distival can be given with complete safety to pregnant women and nursing mothers without adverse effect on the mother or the child. It was also marketed as safer than barbiturates, especially for children, elderly patients, and pregnant women. Some of these ads even emphasized that thalidomide didn't carry the addiction risks or overdose risks associated with barbiturates, which would encourage the use across all age groups, encouraging its safety, as well as the minimization of the risk of overdose when a child grabs their parent's uh, pill bottle. Doctors were also given free samples, and the drug was widely prescribed without, adi without adequate testing on pregnant animals or lo a long-term study on humans. So what happened to pregnant women and their children? So between 1957 and 1961, over 10,000 babies were born with devastating birth defects due to thalidomide. One of the most horrifying episodes in medical history. The most visual of these effects was phocomelia, which was a condition in which the arms or legs were absent or shortened, with hands or feet attached directly to the torso of the child. Many of these babies also suffered from malformed hearts and kidneys, from underdeveloped lungs, and blindness, deafness, or missing ears. About 40% of these affected infants died within their first year and survivors required lifelong surgeries, prosthetics, and support, and faced immense psychological, physical, and social pressure and challenges. So why does thalidomide do this? What happened? Well, thalidomide is a teratogen, which means that it disrupts fetal development, and it blocks angiogenesis, which means the formation of new blood vessels. So in early pregnancy, this meant um, that it prevented the normal limb and organ formation that normally happens in fetal development. So to give you kind of a timeline, the critical exposure window, so when thalidomide being taken would damage the fetus the most, would be day 20 to 36 post-fertilization, or about 34 to 50 days after the last menstrual period. So on day 20, there was, it was associated with brain damage. Around day 22 was associated with eye and ear deformations, um, around day 24 to 28 was associated with limb defects, 28 to 36 was organ damage, and after 42, the risk started tapering off a little bit more, but it was still absolutely not safe to take. The aftermath of such a disaster was that there was a lot more FDA regulation, there was a lot more power given the CFDA. Even though the U.S. avoided the tragedy due to, again, the efforts of Dr. Francis Kelsey, who blocked the FDA approval of it, um, public outcry from the global disaster led to the 1962 Kefhaver harris Amendments that required proof of efficacy and safety of the drug and mandated animal testing, including on pregnant animals, and it gave the FDA broader control over drug approval and marketing. Today, thalidomide is still used only for multiple myeloma and leprosy complications, so fairly rare conditions. It's also dispensed under REMS, which means risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, which requires monthly pregnancy testing, two forms of birth control, 
and limited prescribing privileges in order to ensure that such a disaster would never occur again. The thalidomide disaster didn't begin with lies. It began with unquestioned assumptions, corporate pressure, and medical overconfidence. The German company that developed thalidomide, Chemie Grunenthal, claimed that even pregnant women could take it. The drug was marketed as safer than barbiturates, endorsed by professionals, and handed out freely. But it was never tested where it mattered most, pregnancy. Misinformation doesn't have to be loud or conspiratorial. Sometimes it's quiet, professional, even well-intentioned. Thalidomide is a reminder. Scientific claims must be tested, not trusted. Lives depend on it. Thank you guys for watching. Um, please like and subscribe for more content and provide any suggestions that you would want us to cover next in the comments. Thank you.